Okay, we're just gonna go through a, just a quick review as far, and we'll just use these bullet point items that are on your PowerPoints, structure, hemodynamics, and then regional vessels. So we'll go through just the bullet points for each one. And then as you have questions, feel free to ask. So as far as structure goes, you should know to begin with, and it's not listed here though, the three layers. You, know, you should know that all of the vessels, except the capillaries, will have the three layers. Three layers being the tunica externa or tunica adventitia, same thing, that will be the more connective tissue component. There's the tunica media, which is a smooth muscle component. And then there's the tunica intima, which is the endothelium, also known as endothelium, and it's the innermost touching, the layer touching the blood. The classes of blood vessels means what are the types of blood vessels, and we can go through them from leaving the heart. The first class of blood vessels that we enter are gonna be known as the elastic arteries. All the large arteries are our elastic arteries. They're the ones that have a lot more elastin with their collagen in the tunica externa and tunica adventitia. The benefit of that is that it allows for the vessel to distend laterally so that between beats, while the heart is filling with blood for the next beat and the heart's not physically pushing blood out during the time, the recoil of these large elastic vessels will maintain forward flow. So their function is to maintain forward flow between beats. They do that because they have more elastin and they're considered elastic vessels. So that's the story for the first segment. Then we branch off into muscular arteries and smaller arterioles, but we'll lump them all together and we'll just call them muscular arterioles. Those guys will be significantly smaller, but a significantly greater surface area in the sense that you might have an elastic vessel coming down to like 100 muscular arterioles. And so there's many more, even though each one will be significantly smaller. Their size to their smooth muscle content in their tunica media um, is what determines overall blood pressure. They are our, ma are our main resistance vessels. That means they're, they have more smooth muscles. So not if you were going to scrape it off compared to the larger elastic arteries. They have smooth muscles in their tunica media. But the, tunic, the muscular <coughs> arterioles, the amount of smooth muscle that is in their tunica media compared to their lumen size or the hole where the blood is going through is very, very much, there's much more, the proportion is greater. So therefore, when those muscles constrict or dilate, it has a greater impact on how much of that vessel is going to be open or closed. Compared to a large elastic artery, it's really not going to change the diameter or radius very much. So there's a greater range of change in these muscular arterioles. Therefore, their dilation or constriction status has a more profound impact on total systemic blood pressure. So blood pressure Actions like the angiotensin II hormone is going to affect primarily those muscular arterioles. It's going to cause them to constrict. That's going to lessen some of the downstream flow, feeds back onto the heart to say we need to now drive more, greater pressure to push through. So whenever you have something that opposes flow like resistance in any of these constriction vessels, and we'll talk about this when we get to the next section of hemodynamics, you have to push harder. So the func so we just went through the elastic arteries, but the function of the muscular arterioles is that they are the main determinant of overall blood pressure, whether it's a dilation or constriction state. That is by virtue of their mass of smooth muscle. Anybody remember the other action that it does or function? has to do with the pulsation. What is it doing to the flow? It dampens the flow. Exactly, it dampens the <clears throat> pulsation. So you have these surges every time the heart constricts and beats and pushes blood out. Then you have the elastic arteries, you know, boinging out and then re releasing, re recoiling and allowing forward flow. So you're seeing these surges, a pressure surges because of the heart ejecting blood. So because of the smooth muscle, it's a bit softer. And in a sense, it absorbs some of that, um, some of those pulsations. So when blood 
leaves these muscular arterioles and are heading down into the capillary beds, it's steady flow. So it enters as, these, as pulsatile flow, but it comes out as steady flow. And then you can go into the capillary beds. Then capillary beds. So the structure of the capillary beds is such that there's no tunica adventitia and there's no tunica media. There is just the tunica intima or endothelium. So it's one cell layer thick. Its main function is to cause, allow for diffusion. So we have glucose and oxygen that's getting delivered out to the tissues in, this, in the capillary beds. Fluid can also escape. There is vasomotion, which is actually um, a constriction and dilation of the pre-capillary sphincter muscles, which are normally meant to divert flow, like more flow to one capillary bed, maybe less to another. But their motion actually causes a little bit of flushing, if you will, that's helping the diffusion component. And it kind of alters a little bit of the hydrostatic pressure there. So that's a, a minor point there though. So the structure of the capillary bed is that you have these little cells that are just butted up very, very closely together. If capillary pressure is really high, those cells can kind of separate and you have more fluid oozing. Or if the downstream pressure is high, maybe the venous pressure isn't very low, venous pressure might be high, and the incoming arterial pressure, so there's less of a gradient, then you may have more oozing and pooling of blood out into the tissues. Um, so you wanna make sure the structure of these continuous capillaries, the um, <laughs> cells are nicely tightly adhered to each other. Um, let's see what else we have. You should know about anastomosis, capillaries, or, sorry, and collaterals. The veins, we have venules, which are now draining fluid out of the capillary beds on its way back to the heart. Veins have all, and venules have all three layers, tunica externa, tunica intima, and media, and then tunica intima, but in smaller proportions because the veins are in a much, much lower pressure. You don't need to have the amount of integrity of the vascular wall as you do on the arterial side. So you have blood coming back, but because by that time you've got blood that is coming back at really low pressures and in cases of it coming from the legs and returning to the heart, it's gonna go against gravity. So we need valves in here. So the valves are made of tunica intima material. And so they push up very easily, but they don't allow for blood to go back down. So they prevent any backflow. And so that's one of the unique structures of the venous side and it's low pressure. I think that kind of covers everything. So when we talk about classes of blood vessels, it really, I'm trying to address, and I have test questions that will utilize that term. So I wanna make sure you understand a class of a blood vessel means is it elastic or muscular, those categories of them, and then what their unique feature might be. So if it's elastic, distension, maintaining forward flow, muscular, more smooth muscle compared to their, dia to their lumen diameter, um, they're going to determine <coughs> blood pressure as well as go from pulsatile to steady flow. Capillaries, one structure, only one layer, veins, all three layers, but have valves and low pressure. So that would kind of be the summary of that. Any questions on that? Okay. So the hemodynamics is the part that makes everybody's skin crawl, usually. <laughs> Here, so if you don't like it, you're probably in good company. Um, so it's a way to just get you to understand the numerics of and the quantitative aspect of blood flow to at least to some degree. So blood flow variables, it's as simple as it can be in a sense of what makes flow. You have a pressure gradient. You're pushing from one, you know, high pressure to low pressure, sort of like a stream going downhill, that just gravity and that elevation is pressure. Pressure from one end to the other end. So that's that's flow. So anything, so the pressure from the arterial side, say if someone's blood pressure is 120 over 80, you start from the left or from the left ventricle to the aorta at 120 millimeters of mercury through the whole circulation and at the right atrium, you're back to zero again. So you have downstream, even though you're coming to the same location, it tube wise, it's farthest away will be the where the lowest pressure is. So obviously that's the pressure gradient. So that's going to drive flow. Now the opposite is going to be resistance. What's obstructing flow? What's getting in the way? What's going to impair flow? If you want to think of it in that context. There are three factors that will affect resistance. Who can name these three factors? Vessel length. So how 
viscosity, so the sludginess, and then the vessel diameter or radius to the power of, which is to the power of four. So that means the radius is actually the most important one. It's also the only one that we're really changing in our body. It's not like we're changing vessel length. And on a regular basis, we're really not changing viscosity to any significant degree. So it happens to be the one that we can have an impact on anyways. And so that's really what I was talking about with regards to muscular arterioles, that there's more smooth muscle to cause that radius or diameter change, which is going to cause to the power of four, a profound impact in resistance, which means just think of resistance as something obstructing flow. If you want to think of it in that way, something that's going to make it harder for flow. So if you have greater amounts of resistance or something that's impeding flow, that feeds back eventually to the heart to say, you have to push harder. And that's why our blood pressure goes up when the resistance increases, because now the heart has to push harder to get through, to send the blood through these types of obstructions. Then you should know about the arterial blood pressure value meaning. So if you recall, we had the art, um, aortic or arterial pressure waveform this and so if someone has a blood pressure of and we'll make up a number say 145 over 90 I'm not doing too well but um so 145 would be up here just write 145 there go what does that mean let's tell you about the heart or about the body yeah so it's the peak pressure the ventricle developed. So that's your peak ventricular pressure it would be 145 millimeters of mercury. And at this junction, we're at 90 millimeters of mercury. And what does that tell you? The what? Exactly. So how much pressure that left ventricle had to generate just to open that aortic semilunar valve just to get blood even started to go. So that tells you two things about the body. It's not just a number. That's what's giving you information. About. And so then what is pulse pressure? Yes. Yeah, so what's the difference between these two? So it would be the diastolic, um, so systolic minus the diastolic. That's pulse pressure. And you should be able to calculate mean arterial pressure, which would be the diastolic blood pressure plus the pulse pressure divided by three. And then you can be able to calculate that. Factors affecting tissue perfusion, that's more like cardiac output. How are you pushing blood out? How is the tissue getting blood? So one example would be hypoxia. If you all of a sudden start working a muscle, if I just you know, grabbed a barbell or dumbbell and just started doing some bicep curls and all my biceps are now utilizing, needing more oxygen because they're making more ATP, so the hypoxic environment, meaning that it's actually extracting more oxygen out of the blood because of the ATP generation, that is actually going to locally vasodilate, cause more blood vessels to open so I can deliver more oxygen. So working muscles can actually modify, increase their own blood flow at a local level. But you can also have more systemic issues where you have, you know, flight or fight enacted, sympathetic nervous system. You can have increased delivery to your muscles before you even started running in anticipation of running because of the flight or fight mechanism being enacted um, or diverted from other places. So that's another example of some variations in tissue perfusion. The baroreflex. Now we have baroreceptors, meaning pressure sensors, in lots of places throughout our body. And we're going to talk about some specifically, well, we actually did in this unit, um, besides the one here, the ones that with regard to the baroreflex are specific to the carotid sinus at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery and the internal and external carotid arteries. That is where we have a baroreflex that will be elicited because that reflex is intended to protect the brain so we can maintain steady flow to the brain at all times. And so if you have too high of pressure coming up into your brain, then the baroreflex would then have an action that would do what? What would the results or the function of the action of the baroreflex be? decrease heart rate and vasodilate. So you would have really a parasympathetic response if you have high pressure coming up that's sensed by the baroreceptors. 
Now, if you have low pressure that these baroreceptors sense, and in order to maintain steady pressure to the brain, what would the baroreflex action be? Vasoconstrict down there, and vaso, uh, in systemic vasoconstriction and heart rate will be increased. So you're gonna have more of a sympathetic nervous system response. So just remember when we're on talking about, you'll see this on the test, you wanna look at it when we refer to, there's a baroreceptor that just senses pressure, but a baroreflex implies you have this action as a reflex, what is that action gonna be? So it's usually a counter action that's gonna fix it in this case. So if you have high pressure, the reflexive action will be things that are gonna, mechanisms to lower pressure to balance it up. So the blood pressure hormones, we didn't know about four hormones. The first one I'll tell you about is the only one that, we, that will lower blood pressure. Does anyone remember that one? Atrial natriuretic peptide. Yep, atrial natriuretic peptide, also known as atrial natriuretic factor. Either one depends on what book you're looking at. So atrial natriuretic peptide is one that comes from the right atrium, and it's released when the right atrium gets stretched out because of high blood volume. And so if you have too much blood volume, it stretches out the right atrium and it tells the kidneys, maybe you should pee out some more volume because we have too much in our body. So it's a diuretic. The other two are antidiuretics. There's, who can name those two? Not that one. Antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. Those two target the kidneys and say, retain sodium, which ultimately is intended to retain water. So we'll get into the details of those when we do unit four and we talk about the renal system. But in the case of antidiuretic hormone that comes from where? Posterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary. Um, and aldosterone, which comes from where? Adrenal the adrenal cortex, yep. Adrenal gland and the cortex specific region. Those target the kidney, retain water, so they increase blood volume, and by increasing blood volume, that will then also increase pressure. So it's kind of a double whammy there. What about angiotensin II? Where does that come from? That one's got a little, yep, so that one was not really meant to be a trick question, but it was not just a low one location like the others were. So this one involves a few steps to generate it. So yes, yeah, so that's why I think we got mixed answers in here. So how does it start? Low pressure, the kidneys are like, oh, not enough blood pressure coming in here. So the kidneys release renin. So renin goes out in the circulation. Renin combines with angiotensinogen to become angiotensin 1, and then angiotensin 1 is on its way back, goes into the right atrium, right ventricle up, and out into the lungs. And in the lungs, what, does, what happens? It goes into via angiotensin converting enzyme, goes from angiotensin 1 to become angiotensin 2. And then it leaves the lungs, and it does it in other places of the body, just so you know, it's not only the lungs, but the lungs has one of the higher concentrations of this enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme. So then as it becomes angiotensin II, it goes through the pulmonary veins, back into the left atrium, back to the heart, so via the left atrium, left ventricle, and now out the aorta systemically. And now you have a very, very potent vasoconstrictor um, that's going all over the body. And it's going to target the media of muscular arterioles and then cause them to do major vasoconstriction, reduce their radius, blood pressure shoots up right away. So two of the most major blood pressure medications affect this particular system. Those two medications also have pleiotropic effects, which means they have a few other positive effects. I will um, that are not always directly related to these. So that's why some of their benefits go beyond just the renin angiotensin system. But for our purposes here, we'll just kind of keep it in the box. The what, who can tell me what one of those medications are? ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors, so ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, stops the formation of what? Angiotensin II. So you have a lot more angiotensin one because you're converting less over. So that's an ACE inhibitor. Then what is the other one? 
An ARB, exactly. So an ARB means it's an angiotensin receptor blocker. So you make angiotensin two, but now you plug up the receptor systemically so that it's not as effective as it otherwise would be. And those are a newer class of drugs than the ACE inhibitors are, but also very good. Okay, any questions on that? As far as hemodynamics go, birth blood blood pressure? Okay. Vessel names, locations, regions, or organs served or drained, if you're talking about one being an artery, if it's serving it or draining it, that'd be the vein side of things. So the context that you're gonna see these would be, for instance, on the multiple choice portion of the exam, it would be obviously descriptive. So it might say something like blood in the thigh on its way to the toes. It's going away from the heart, so it's gonna be a artery. artery and therefore popliteal artery. So then the same question could be blood in the thigh on the way back to the heart, then it would be the vein, but then we're looking at external iliac vein. And so it's just a matter of just being more descriptive regionally of what it is, where it's going, so you know is it an artery or is it a vein, and just kind of knowing the body part locations. On the practical exam, you'll need to know it like whether there's a diagram. So for the online folks, their diagrams are gonna be limited to what's on those worksheets where they're more regional pictures. Cadaver, some are cadaver pictures, some of them are colored pictures. For you guys in class, you're gonna have more of an overall body diagram like we did on the board where it's gonna be more black and white, less zoomed in regionally, but just kind of an overall body one. So you'll be able to tell if it's an artery or vein because you're gonna to need to look at the heart. And if you see like an aortic arch, obviously with the branches coming off, then you know you're gonna look at the arterial tree. If you're seeing the heart and that's kind of two are coming on the one side, then you know, oh, that's the vena cava coming in, then you know you're looking at the venous kind of set. So it's, that would be the way that you would discern it without having to stick with red or blue kind of thing. The other context that you'll need to know vessels would be a descriptive sense of you writing them out one vessel to the next vessel, if I were to say, hey, blood going to say to the right ear or the left thumb or the right toe, where it's kind of going to different body parts. So if we go to the right ear, it would be, you know, aorta, brachiocephalic trunk, right common carotid artery, right external carotid artery, you know, ear capillary, since we didn't name any smaller vessels beyond that, and then right external jugular vein to the right subclavian vein, to the right brachiocephalic vein, to the superior vena cava, and then to the heart. So that would be the, or the left arm, you know, the left thumb, we would say, you know, aorta, left subclavian artery, left axillary artery, left brachial artery, left radial artery, and like thumb capillaries. And then you would pretty much name them back. The only exception coming back is that then you have a brachiocephalic vein on the way back. So it would be kind of remembering when you have or don't have brachiocephalic veins, especially if you're dealing with obviously the upper body. Um, if you're dealing, if we go down to the toes, then it's a matter of knowing which iliacs. That tends to be the more difficult one, I think, for some folks and kind of blank lines back. But you have to remember whether it's a labeling diagram or even the written out ones, right or left, you can do an R or L without, as abbreviation is okay without penalty. And you have to write artery in vein on every one of them. And you have, you can write a little A or a little V as an abbreviation also for those, if for to save space, if you want to do that. Um, but don't forget that because that is knocking off points. So you definitely have to do that for each single one. It is repetitive, but it's a bit easy way to lose points and that would be a sad way to lose points. Know about regional areas. For instance, you should know some of like, for instance, the hepatic portal vein. You should know that it is stuff coming from the abdominal cavity, like intestines, you've just absorbed stuff. And it, and like the spleen, it's all coming to the liver for filtration first before then it dumps into the hepatic vein and then inferior vena cava. So know that the hepatic portal vein is bringing blood to the liver where just the hepatic vein is leaving the liver but back to the inferior vena cava. Who can tell me another vessel that's bringing blood to the liver? But in this case, it would be oxygenated blood. The liver, like this little triangle, and we have from the guts and the spleen, lots of places coming in to the liver. This was the hepatic portal vein. And then 
the clean blood leaves the liver by the hepatic vein. It's going into the inferior vena cava. The other vessel that brings blood to the liver is just hepatic artery. As we're coming from here, what other, it's coming from the celiac trunk. So while we're here, the celiac trunk branches, we now know hepatic artery, but what are the other two branches off the celiac trunk? Yep, so we have the splenic artery heading off over there to the spleen, and then the other being? Left gastric. Left gastric, going to the stomach, that's right there. Good. Um, other regional things would be like the brain arteries, like circle of Willis. For instance, you have the internal carotids as well as the basilar bringing blood into the circle, but they're not part of the circle. Then you have the actual circle of Willis where you have the posterior cerebral sort of starts it off, posterior communicating, anterior cerebral, and the anterior communicating. That's actually the circle. So you should know the circle of Willis vessels, which is different than vessels serving it. And they do have a question that asks you to distinguish between the two. Um, Definitely need to know about the fetal circulation. So you should know about um, umbilical artery vein. You should know about the bypasses. You should know about when the vein's coming in um, to the liver. You should know the foramen ovale that it's going from the right atrium to the left atrium. You should know about the ductus arteriosus going from the pulmonary artery to the aorta. Um, ductus venosus. Also, you've got that coming from the umbilical vein to the liver as it brings blood into there. So you should know that. So as far as blood goes, we did the basics with plasma. We went through red blood cells with white blood cells and then platelets and hemostasis, which means just clotting. So as far as the basics in plasma, you should just know overall what's the job of blood, what's the composition of blood, and then specifically getting down to the plasma itself. So the plasma itself, we can see in this picture at the top, like a whole blood, if we spin it down to so the second layer here, that is really the hematocrit. So you guys remember, you should know what hematocrit is. So where you spin it, put blood in a capillary tube, spin it in a centrifuge, the cells get winged off to one side, and so then it separates it from the plasma. So you can see the plasma component, it's roughly 50-50, um, or a little less than the plasma cell. So men tend to be closer to the 50% line. Women tend to be under the 45% line with regard to the content of red blood cells. In just the plasma side, it is 90% water. And then in the plasma part, 7% of it are made of proteins. And you should know the three most numerous proteins in there. The most numerous being albumin. Albumin is a large protein. Who can tell me where albumin's made as well as all the rest of the proteins? The liver. So the plasma is going to be made of the albumin, so that's coming from the liver. Albumin is a large protein that actually stays in the blood. And what is the purpose of albumin? It's a carrier protein. It's a carrier, so things can bind onto it and just get shipped through the body. What's another purpose? Retain water. So if you have these big protein structures in the blood, when the blood gets to a capillary bed, there's just a thin little veil of endothelium between what's in the blood and the tissue. There's a lot of protein out in the tissue. So albumin helps to balance that concentration out and that can makes water more likely to stay in the blood. So if somebody has some sort of liver, a compromised liver situation where they're not producing enough blood protein, specifically albumin, they will have edema because they, have, they don't have as much stuff that's maintaining an osmotic gradient to hold that water inside the capillary. Um, the next most numerous protein that's gonna be in the blood are the globulin family. What are the two main groups within that family? HDL, HDL LDL, which is in the lipo, lipoprotein grouping, and that's commonly known as? Cholesterol, yeah, and the HDL, LDL being good versus bad cholesterol, but the lipoproteins are just cholesterol. The, what's the other one? Globulin. The immunoglobulins. The immunoglobulins are gonna be like your IgA, IgE, all those that we talked about with the immune system. So that's in that family too, circulating. Fibrinogen, what does that do? Blood clotting. So we know, and we'll talk about that when we get to the next section. So fibrinogen is really the last step in forming fibrin, which is the actual clot strands. Red blood cell production, regulation, structure, and function. 
Where are they made? Bone marrow. marrow. What do they do? We carry oxygen. Just, yep. So there are oxygen buses. That's just their sole purpose. Regulation might be how do we make more in our body? What is a condition that would cause our body to make more red blood cells? which would be low oxygen environment. So low oxygen environment, which occurs at high altitude or higher altitudes, would increase your red blood cell production. So you have better delivery. The structure, what does it look like or shape like? It's a biconcave disc, which really just means it's like a laminated inner tube. Why is it shaped like that? It doesn't have a nucleus, it's missing some organelles. And so the reason why it's missing some organelles, so if for, there's two reasons. One is that it can pack in more hemoglobin so that can bind to more oxygen. Since its job is to carry oxygen, if we can unload some of this other organelle crap that we don't want to deal with, we can fill it up with more hemoglobin and have increased delivery of oxygen. The other being it can twist and turn and bend more easily. And so it can make it into smaller, tighter corners, small capillary beds without obstructing. And so we don't have to worry about. So that's where some diseases like sickle cell anemia, where they, um, the, they become rigid or ill-shaped, then they become problematic because they get obstructed some of the capillary beds and there's limiting the flow. What is the lifespan? Since we don't have a nucleus, it's not gonna last very long, so how long does it last? Four months, about 120 days, exactly. What happens to it when it gets to the end of its life? It gets devoured by macrophages in the spleen. What part of the spleen is doing this? So the red pulp is like this reticular, loose reticular connective tissue. The red pulp snags these worn out red blood cells, macrophages, other phagocytic cells will go in, consume it, break it down, it's all digested, excretes it out, and then the iron that gets broken down, that returns back to our bone marrow so we can make more red blood cells, and the other components are just considered waste, the majority of it being bilirubin, that's gonna make its way through the portal system to the liver, and then the liver can dump it out. So you can increase or get your bilirubin levels increased, which is jaundice, if you're either breaking down a lot of red blood cells and your liver can't keep up, or the liver has other issues that it's processing, so it can't keep up. So the not keep up could be one way to raise bilirubin levels, um, or it's just having a hard time excreting it out to the body. So you're either increasing the load going in or you're having a difficult time processing and excreting it out. So one way people can assist in their, their liver in breaking down the bilirubin is just going out into the sun, being exposed to UV light. That breaks down the bilirubin, so when it arrives to the liver, it's not really having to do as much to it, and it can more easily process it, and you can get rid of it. The anemia. What is the definition, a simple definition of anemia? Low oxygen delivery. So you can do that in a couple of ways. What are the three types of anemia that we have covered here? Aplastic anemia, which is not making enough. You don't make enough so that you don't have enough delivery. So that's why you're not delivering enough. You don't have very many oxygen buses. Then we have a hemolytic anemia, which is breaking down. It's just breaking down or you've made ill-formed red blood cells. They're really not just doing their job or they're just... So pernicious is sneaky because it's not like, hey, we're breaking them down or we're not making enough. Those are the two obvious ones. Pernicious is sneaky because it doesn't mean either one. You actually have enough red blood cells and they look like normal red blood cells except for one hemoglobin inside it. You need vitamin B12 in order for your bone marrow to put, in, put together the hemoglobin. Those are the three types of anemia. And so that's why it's more accurate to say lack of oxygen delivery. You're either not delivering it because you don't have enough red blood cells or you're breaking your red, red blood cells down or your red blood cells have a reduced carrying capacity. So those would be, all of those are covered by that definition. So what is polycythemia then? Too many or higher than normal red blood cells. So it doesn't always have to be a pathology. It could be you're just living up at altitude and you just have a higher hematocrit. And hematocrit is how you would measure it. You would just look at someone's plasma as long as they're properly hydrated. So 
they're dehydrated, that can be change the result. So a normally properly hydrated person gets their hematocrit done, and there's whoa, well over 50% of their blood, especially if it was a woman, then that would be polycythemic because it'd be higher than normal red blood cell levels, usually because they're at altitude. Some of the tests, so you should be able to know how to do blood typing. So you know that the blood typing is always done on sort of the card here, and it's always has the three wells. So even if they're not labeled, you know the first well is always going to indicate an A marker. The second well will always indicate a B marker. And the third well, by standard, is going to be the plus minus. So you should be able to know that if there's some clotting, say we have clotting in the first two wells, what would this, what blood type would be indicated? A, B, this is A, B negative. What if all three of them? A, B positive. What if just these two? B positive. What about these? Just the end one being that's O positive. What if none of them? O and A of six, that part will be for you guys. You should also know about blood typing. Who can donate to who? So if we were to say, well, you should be able to recall, and the easiest way to think about it is the donor's cells. That's what's going into the body. Ignore the plasma of the donor. That's not a non-consideration. So the cells of the donor going into a patient or recipient and that person's plasma antibodies. The antibodies of a person tell you what not to give them, basically. So the answer should be, if I were to ask a question of, can this blood type, and I may have indicated, can you donate to this one? I mean, if I do it graphically, or if I say A, donate to B, your answer would be no. And the reason being, not that they're incompatible, but the reason being A cannot donate to B because the plasma antibodies that are anti-A will bind with the incoming red blood cells with the A marker. That you're identifying it's the A marker of the red blood cells incoming and the plasma antibodies of the recipient that's doing the reacting. So that's the answer that you will want to include in terms of your justification for or against. Um, a donor being, donation being able to happen. The RH factor, you should be clear about hemolytic disease of the newborn where it only affects RH negative mothers if they have an RH positive baby. If an RH positive mother, it doesn't matter. She already knows about RH. There's no antibodies that are gonna be made. It would only be an RH negative mother that would be exposed if she had an RH positive baby the first baby would be fine. It would be any subsequent babies after that. So they're given Rogam to prevent the antibodies from being made in the first place. Okay. So white blood cells. What are the five types of white blood cells that you need to know? Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. What, tell me the three that are granulocytes and have a crazy nucleus. Neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil. So those are the granulocytes. They each have little packets of granules. Each one's gonna have a unique content in their granules. What are the two A granulocytes? The A meaning there are no granules in it. Monocytes and lymphocytes. What does a lymphocyte look like? Yeah, so it's the smaller cell the majority of the cell is made up, is, is just filled with this nucleus, and there's a tiny little sliver of cytoplasm to the side, so they're distinct in that way. A monocyte is gonna be slightly bigger, and often the walls of it are kind of more wavy, they're less defined. They could be all kinds of different shapes, so they, but they tend to be bigger, and they have a large nucleus, but that takes up not the major, well, up a lot of the nuclear of the cytoplasm but not as much as on a lymphocyte and it's often like a kidney bean shape rather than being nice and round like a lymphocyte if you had a high level of neutrophils what in general just for just generality purposes for this class what condition would a person be considered to have an acute bacterial infection so the key is acute in that it's an really recent onset infection. What about lymphocytes? 
be at a high level of those. We'd have a viral infection and, and there could be bacterial causes too, certainly. It takes a while for those levels to go up while they're figuring it out. So in general, it sort of tells you that there's something more significant that's ongoing in that case. What about monocytes, if there's a higher level of those? Much more of a chronic. There's a higher, it takes a while for those, the, them to develop higher numbers. So the, the infection has been going on for some time. So those are things that's happening over a longer course of time. What about eosinophils? What would the person be worried about if they had a high eosinophil count? Parasites, yeah, ew. And then what about basophils? That would be an allergy, allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. So those, so you should have an idea of what their normal percentages are and then what's going on if there's too much of them, what their job is, and then you're gonna see a picture, a couple pictures of these guys. So I'll be naming them and then answering some of those types of questions. So the, what we just did by saying, hey, there's too many lymphocytes, or there's too many eosinophils, that test is known as a white blood cell differential, because you're telling the difference between them. It's different, it's more precise and um, than just a white blood cell count. The count just says, hey, there's a lot of them or there's not very many of them, but it's not telling what's more or less of. So the white blood cell differential is giving you what those are. So we're looking at part four, platelets and hemostasis. Platelets are cellular derived. They are pieces of cells. So they also originate from the bone marrow. They are little chunks of cells that are circulating around that when they hit, exposed vessel wall components, they become activated and they stick to it, they get activated and they cause additional platelets to then come and stick to them to form an initial platelet plug. So you should be comfortable knowing the process of the clot formation and really the three basic steps. So I'll draw in black the components as we go through these steps that's already in your blood, that your body's already made and then we'll do in colors what things get converted into that they're um, as, they, as each step progresses. So we begin with platelets. Okay, platelets, they're gonna clump together. So we're gonna go all jam up, dog pile together. And when they clump together to form a temporary platelet plug, what chemical comes out of that? Prothrombinase. Prothrombinase combines with calcium that's already circulating in the blood. These two guys together will cause the conversion of prothrombin to become what? Thrombin. Thrombin is going to facilitate the conversion of what? Fibrinogen to fibrin. Okay, so fibrin is the clot itself. Fibrin is now these little fibrous strands. Red blood cells get stuck in. It looks like a big beaver dam. If, when we're done, in the clot, and we don't want it around anymore, what does our body make that would break up fibrin? Plasmin. What is something that you can give to somebody that would break it up? Streptokinase. Mm -hmm. Where would aspirin work to impair this process? Yeah, so aspirin is gonna minimize platelet aggregation. What about Coumadin? Coumadin blocks the absorption of vitamin K and therefore reduces the production by the liver of prothrombin. So you have less prothrombin available. What blocks the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin? Yes, this would be heparin. Okay. So these in red are considered anticoagulants because they're preventing the formation of fibrin. Plasmin, so that's known as a fibrinolytic Lymph, what is lymph 
composed of? What is it like similar to? Real similar to plasma. So it doesn't have the big red blood cells from the blood. It doesn't have big things like albumin or the big chunky things because that stayed in the blood. Lymph is created at the tissues. So any of the fluid that escaped the capillary bed that's out in the tissue, lymph is this extra drainage system removing that from the tissues. If it has any tissue debris, there might be antigens in the, the area. There maybe it's a site of infection that's being drained. Maybe it's a post-surgical site. Maybe it's a swelling from something. So that's going to be what's drained out this fluid is. And so it goes through a series of lymph nodes to provide our immune system an opportunity to inspect in case there are antigens before we send it into the blood and you know, let it loose throughout the whole entire body. So it's a way to try to compartmentalize um, any particular antigen from mobilizing too much to our body. So the composition of lymph is going to be really clear, watery. Um, it's going to contain mostly water, some immune components, obviously from the lymph nodes, but it doesn't have the main large protein structures that's found within the blood. So we have lymph vessels that function really similarly to veins because they're going to be low pressure. They're bringing the fluid back towards the heart. They have valves to prevent backflow. The only difference being it's running through a series of uh, lymph nodes. We have areas in our body where there's a higher concentrated number of lymph nodes in like in our inguinal region, in our axillary region, or our cervical region. So those are some clusters, but we have lymph nodes in lots of other places, not just those. Those just are clusters of them. Um, lymph is returned to the blood via the subclavian veins. The majority of lymph is returned via which duct into which subclavian vein? So the majority, 75% plus of our lymph comes back via the thoracic duct into the left subclavian vein. And then the remaining comes into the right subclavian vein. The lymph nodes, you should be able to spot one. Histology, no histology of a lymph node. There's a medulla in the middle and the cortex on the outside. They've got germinal centers. What type of cell would be in the medulla region, part of our specific immune system? T cells. And why is that? Yeah, so they, T cells require cell-to-cell -cell contact in order to eliminate an antigen. So that wants to be on the medulla where most of the fluid is coming through. What type of cells would be clustered in those germinal centers out in the cortex? B, plasma B cells, um, for, because they make the antibodies and the antibodies then can be sent down into the medulla region. Spleen is located where? The spleen is located in your left upper abdominal region above your kidney. It is just a round organ that blood filters through. What is the two jobs what are the, of the spleen? Removing the old red blood cells. What part of the spleen does that? Red pulp. Yep. And then what is the other component of the spleen? White pulp. And, and that is the, inspecting the blood for any circulating or blood-borne antigens. That's the job of that. Then the thymus, where is that located? In the chest. So we're right in the thoracic cavity. <laughs> is the function of the thymus. To mature lymphocytes, so you have your just Joblo your lymphocytes from the marrow into the thymus and then they become T lymphocytes. So they are not T cells before they were in the thymus, but they are indeed after they were in the thymus. But they are naive T cells when they leave the thymus, meaning they're a T cell, but they still have yet to be coded for a specific antigen. They have to, you have to have some sort of exposure to that an antigen in order for these sensitize into something that they're coded for. Who can tell me what malt is? Yep, so mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Where is malt located? Tonsils being one of the places. On our respiratory tract, any place that's got mucosa, GI tract even, 
The GI tract is called GALT, but it's still part of the malt, still mucosa. Um, it could be any entrance, like females, the vaginal wall has, is, has mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Any, and we have lymphoid tissue all throughout. So we talked about Peyer's patches specifically in the gut, and that's in the ileum. But you can have um, some malt and lymphoid tissue in the esophagus and in the stomach and in the other parts of the small intestine. So we have it throughout the whole GI tract. It's just right in the ileum. There's loads of them packed together that those make a distinct area called the Peyer's patches. So the nonspecific defenses, you want to be able to identify both external, not all books include it. I just want you to include it as part of the nonspecific. External defenses being don't get in the body in the first place. I'd be like skin, you know, or, you know, earwax at that, you know, even acidity of our, of some of our, of the skin of our sweat and stuff. So those would be external things. If you don't get it in the first place, then you don't have to worry about it. So that's a, one of your best defenses. So then you should know about the internal components. So this slide is probably the best one giving you kind of a checklist of what's going on in our non-specific. So we talked about the external barriers of not even letting something in, just the fact that the surface of our skin is dead that is a huge help because you don't have viruses invading you from that because it's just going to be on dead cells. They can't do anything with that. Phagocytosis, that's obviously the process of one cell consuming another. So we do that in the normal everyday world of in fixing repairs, eating up old damaged skin cells perhaps um, before we get to repair some skin cell areas. But in the act of that, these phagocytic cells might consume an antigen and their antigen presenting capabilities would then allow you to alert the specific immune system side, even though the phagocytic cells are antigen presenting cells, they're in the non-specific side, but that's how you can make notice of the specific side of an antigen being in the body. Inflammation helps bring your immune system components to the site of infection or damage. Natural killer cells, they are a subgroup of lymphocytes, but they are indeed in the non-specific category, these natural killer cells are targeting self cells, self cells that have gone bad. So whether they've been invaded by a virus or whether they were malformed and are going to be a cancer cell. So they are ways that we can actually kill some of our own cells for our own protection. Fever is a state that our body gets put in. We reset our hypothalamus. We raise the temperature, our core body temperature, so we make it a lot harder for incoming antigens to proliferate and make more while our BT and T cells are trying to figure out how to fight them in the first place. So fever helps our body by time, our immune system by time. Interferon is a chemical that's released by cells that have been invaded by viruses and in other circumstances, but they're ways of our cells to signal out, you know, perhaps the natural killer cells to identify cells that are indeed damaged and that need to be eliminated and removed. Complement is another chemical process in our body that actually amplifies and enhances any currently ongoing process. So whether it augments inflammation or other chemical activation components complement will increase that activity. So it's just not a unique thing. It's enhancing what we're already doing, at least. And there's a lot of elements to that, increasing binding and things like that. That's nonspecific. So nonspecific just means your body's way of fighting an antigen. It doesn't really care who it is. Specific is your B and T cells. But we have B and T cells that are just coded for only a single antigen. So you may have B and T cells that, you know, came from a cold that you had in the first grade. So that B and T cell is going to sit around and you could have measles in your body. And it's like, that is not my job and it will not do anything to it. So they are specific. And once they code for identify a specific antigen, that little group of B and T cells will not affect anything else. Anytime you're exposed to an antigen, your body will then make B and T cells that will target and fight that. But the key is the memory cells that come with them. So maybe the cold that you had back in kindergarten or first grade, you still have B and T memory cells for that and you'll be protected. And if that cold happens to come back around, 
your fighters have died off after that long of time. So it might take a few days for you to get up and going, but not the three weeks that it would be if you had never been exposed to that before. So it may not be as quick, which is why sometimes when people get vaccinations, they get booster shots because it will help keep the active fighters going um, more readily accessible. But even if it's not something that you've been exposed to for a really long time, you will have memory cells for them. So that is the key to the specific immune system defense is that you create memory cells. So for the B cell family, you will have memory cells and you need to know about plasma cells. What do plasma cells do? Or plasma B cells? They make antibodies, yeah. So they make the antibodies for whatever antigen that B cell family is targeted to fight, whether it's the cold from kindergarten or whether it was your smallpox vaccine, it's gonna make antibodies that will only identify just that specific antigen. On the T cell side, you're gonna to need to know about helper T cells, suppressor T cells, also known as regulatory T cells. Um, you'll you know about memory T cells clearly, and then cytotoxic T cells. Those are the actual fighters. Those are the ones that are like gonna bind onto an antigen and snuff it out and remove it from circulation. So the other ones are involved in the process. So you should know about each of those. Immunizations, so active immunization is that you are exposed to an antigen, either through a vaccination where you get a shot, like smallpox or chickenpox or whatever, that's gonna be a part of that antigen so that your body can see it and figure out how to fight it and create memory cells for it, or you just got sick and then your body saw it created memory cells for it and figure out how to fight it. So that's active immunity. Passive immunity is when you receive antibodies that another source produced. So it's given to babies via breast milk when they're nursing, or it's given to people that are sick via a serum that came from somebody else's blood that had been exposed to that same antigen before and survived. Right, that's pretty much covers it. There, so what we went through today are most of the big picture things on those kind of lists. So what they mean is those big areas are, there's usually a grouping of questions that if you understand these big concepts that you could manage your way um, through a series of questions. There's a lot of other additional questions. I do my best to try to ask a question from each slide. So when I'm writing test questions, that's what I do. I kind of pop up the slides and I'm like, okay, what do I need to ask from this slide? What do I need to ask from this slide? So there's other details that are out there that we may not have covered today in our big picture ones. The big picture ones kind of gives you the main points that you should have gotten out of each of these chapters. And then make sure you review some of the other elements. There's a couple more details.